Whatever you do for a living, whether you charge by the hour, the item, by the project, or per line of code, you can, within a few minutes and for less than a dollar, create a customized digital token on the Bitcoin blockchain, which you control and uh, issue at will, and which allows you to know with 100% certainty that anyone who has your token must have gotten it from you or someone who first got it from you, because otherwise it provably could not exist. This token you've created has rules you set defining what value you'll provide, for, you'll provi provide when presented with it and under what conditions it can be presented to you. It can then be priced as you see fit and loaded into an automated digital vending machine, allowing anyone in the world with Bitcoin or other valuable tokens to buy prepaid units of your work, which can be given to friends, swapped or saved as the purchaser sees fit, and eventually redeemed on your website in place of other payments and in compliance with the rules you've set out. My name, as you know, is Adam B. Levine. I founded the long-running Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast, which the last time I did a conference, which was about maybe 18 months ago, a lot of people had heard of. I'm curious if that's still the case. Anybody here listen to Let's Talk Bitcoin? Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so in January of 20... Uh, so I, I founded the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast to explore the ideas, people, and projects behind kind of this cryptocurrency innovation. And uh, we got started in April of 2013, along with Andreas Antonopoulos, as has been mentioned, and Stephanie Murphy. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's hard to give this talk because, like I said, I haven't done a conference in the last 18 months. And that's been because I fell down a rabbit hole and wound up turning from a journalist into somebody who's actually starting a company running one of these things and uh, trying to bring some of these interesting innovations that I saw as possibilities into reality because it wasn't happening fast enough. Tokens and cryptocurrency. There we go. Tokens and cryptocurrency are like apples and oranges. They're both fruit, but with differing characteristics. Both cryptocurrencies and tokens use blockchains, but a cryptocurrency maintains its own blockchain, and at least part of the use of its token is to pay the miners for that work. In contrast, an unlimited number of tokens issued by different people can use a blockchain as uh, can use a blockchain like Bitcoin as passengers on the network rather than as the network itself. They pay a standard fee using Bitcoin whenever they make a transaction, but pretty much that's it. While something like Bitcoin is valuable because it literally is how you pay the postage to send things on the Bitcoin network, what I generically call tokens can't be used to pay that fee. And so for a token to be valuable, it must be something, there must be something about it that makes it desirable or useful. So tokens, just to summarize, are a neutral, brandable, secure, intercompatible cryptographic vehicle which can be created as needed and which can be held by users in a single wallet along with Bitcoin and other tokens, basically enjoying all of the advantages of a blockchain and none of the cost. So now that we have this neutral vehicle, what can you do with it? While the technology is there to do just about anything with a token, these possibilities are restricted by legal systems around the world. Just to get our terms straight, a currency token is something that has no value except that which the market gives it, and an equity type token is anything that looks, walks, or quacks like a token sold to those who want to, uh, who are basically investing in something and expecting a return. Currency and equity, whether in token form or not, have all sorts of special government rules about how things can or can't be treated. So it's really less about the technology and what we can do with it, and more about who gets to decide what we do with it and whether those being disrupted are willing to give permission to those doing the disrupting. By contrast, non-currency uses of tokens are not trying to do anything that governments or regulatory bodies care about too much. They get the advantages of cryptocurrencies, robust infrastructure, and cash-like characteristics, but without much of the drama that seems unavoidable when presenting a revolutionary alternative to global financial systems. If Bitcoin is digital cash, redeemable tokens are digital gift certificates. Once purchased, the merchant doesn't need to worry about who they owe the product to. They only need to make sure that they fulfill their side of the bargain to whoever turns up with their token. This means that a token can trade hands dozens or even hundreds of times without the merchant knowing, and yet they can trust that if a user has their token, they were paid for that product at some point in the past. Okay. So a simple example here is, user buys a product in token form, there's a big gap where a whole lot of different things can happen, and then someone redeems the token for the product that it represents. A more interesting example uh, is uh, crowdfunding, basically. Um, I am absolutely a sucker for the use case with crowdfunding. It's the first thing that we're going after with Tokenly, and it's really been a difficult time to kind of narrow in on what that is because the opportunities here are pretty ridiculous. So let's just look at this for a second. So if Bob helps Alice fund her campaign, her crowdfunding campaign, then Alice will promise Bob a remote when it's ready to ship. 
this doesn't really work that well for Bob or Alice, because if Bob changes his mind and needs his money back, the only person he can get it back from is Alice. And chances are pretty good that Alice already spent it trying to make that remote for him. So this leaves kind of a bad situation. It means that either Alice refunds Bob and makes the project more likely to fail because one of the backers just pulled out and wanted their money back without any sort of discount, uh, or Alice leaves Bob with the unhappy result of he has a promise and there's nothing he can do about it. So hope you like that remote. Once she successfully raised her money, Alice could instead create a unique token to represent each type of reward that she sold to her campaign backers. Instead of getting a promise, they have a cash-like representation of their support that they can do whatever they want with. If Bob wants his money back, instead of asking Alice for a refund, he can find somebody else who's interested to buy it from him, or even set up his own online vending machine, offering extra tokens he has for sale, and buying ones that he'd like more of. When Alice is ready to ship her rewards, she simply sets up her e-commerce system to accept credit cards and cryptocurrencies at prices set in dollars with her reward tokens, uh, and uh, accepting her reward tokens at fixed value. I love that you use the term redemption, John. That's a term that we're not really hearing that much yet because people view these tokens as exchangeable, but really the redemption is the important part about uh, tokens. So the last and probably my favorite kind of use would be access tokens, which we've been working with for about a year and a half now. You can think about them like tradable passwords in cryptocurrency form that grant you specific kinds of access, not for spending them, but for possessing them. If we know that a single Bitcoin address can contain any number of tokens, each in a unique amount, with, uh, then any website, service, or app can non-exclusively ask a user to prove that they own a Bitcoin address, and then treat its contents as the user's property, giving them specific powers, access, privileges, or rights within the platform, depending on the rules of the platform. So looking at our crowdfunding example again, everything is the same as before, except in this example, Alice can also decide to make Bob's a redeemable token into an access token to allow her to keep in touch with her supporters. Now Alice can share privately, early, or private, early, or behind the scenes information with all of the current supporters of her campaign, not based on who supported her originally, but who has each of the various rewards now. Alice can let all backers access the same information or can give different specific types of permissions and even communicate differently based on the tokens each supporter has. When I uh, talk about tokens, um, I do it generically. Um, there are a number of different technologies and protocols that you can create them on. Since the beginning, we've used Counterparty, which was pretty much the only stable platform at the time we were looking. And while every protocol has its specific mix of advantages and disadvantages, they all provide that same basic broad opportunity to create cheap, cash-like, brandable tokens. So the question really became for us, once you've got the token, how do you make it useful? Another commonality between the various technologies is that the token by itself can do nothing. When I'm talking about token-controlled access, that is a two-part system. The token part is taken care of on the blockchain, but the rules and the, the, the procedures and everything that a platform wants to bestow on whoever has it, that all happens entirely within that closed platform. So it's, you know, it's a lock and a key system. It's just that the key no longer lives on your server where it's vulnerable to being hacked or vulnerable to being stolen. And because of that, again, it means that there's no downside to a user actually having the right, having the ownership of the thing that they've purchased from you, whether it be a membership or anything else. And so they should be able to do what they can in real life with it. So this was exactly the situation that uh, we found ourselves in after launching the LTB coin rewards program, which I believe was the first cryptographic uh, token rewards program launched in June of 2014. Um, We'd created the token, defined what kind of users would earn it, and even built a simple tool that sent out unique amounts to hundreds and eventually thousands of participants um, for about a penny or two a week, although it, as it's been pointed out here, with the price of Bitcoin now at 500, our cost is gonna go up to about six cents per week. So um, one of the important things to note about this stuff is that Bitcoin is where you should prototype things, but I think it's become obvious to anybody who's doing anything serious that it's not where you're gonna scale. If you might scale with the Lightning Network, you might scale with side chains, but it's not gonna be on the basic Bitcoin blockchain. But that said, starting something on the Bitcoin blockchain is really worth doing because it is the chain to do things on. It's where you'll find users, it's where, where you'll find traction, it's where you can prove if your idea is worth building its own blockchain for. So that's kind of the approach that I take is technology in the future is fantastic, I'm excited about Ethereum and everything else, but the reality is, is what's out now actually works. We can actually test it. It can happen now. And that's kind of another commonality is all of this stuff happens right now. So, uh, <laughs> so a gentleman by the name of Jeremy Lamb had started a company about the time that we were starting, um, that we were starting the LTB coin rewards program called Vend that was building online vending machines for Bitcoin and tokens. 
From first sight, I was hooked on this concept. This was the solution that we needed, and further, it could be the basis for a whole variety of tools that would enable everything from threshold-based crowdfunding to auctions to charity drives. The only problem was Jeremy's company was new and quickly became overwhelmed. And to make a long story short, while I'm still waiting for that uh, solution from Vend, over the last year I've put my money where my mouth is and uh, funded uh, my own company that's been building many of these same solutions and tools. So Tokenly is an open source infrastructure company. Um, we've built tools to make it easy and fast to do everything from rent a single digital vending machine as a merchant to offering your users a, se a secure, simple wallet which can have individual branded tokens in it or custom brand the entire wallet, although we're not encouraging people to do that because we've discovered that once they brand it, they stop updating it. And these products are very much in development, and so it's kind of important that you keep updating them. Our products are designed to work together uh, modularly, and when you create a vending machine or an auction, you can stick it right into your store and perform normal sales, credit card sales, token sales, and token redemptions in one easy embeddable solution. And also we offer everything via API too, because that is the way of the world. These things need to be provided as solutions, not as an additional puzzle that everybody needs to uncover on their own. So, um, yeah, so we're getting ready to launch our, uh, we're getting ready to launch our uh, first open alpha where people will actually be able to see these tools. They've been in kind of a closed alpha and we've been experimenting. We have one customer that's been meaningful, but anyways, I don't want to get bogged down on this. The whole reason for this talk is because there are some solutions and some very interesting ideas that once you have this as a basis, that is just understood, this is possible, then a lot of things can become possible that are very interesting. So for example, I live in the Napa Valley and every year there's a big fundraiser and auction where attendees spend about $15 million in a night. You can donate any time of the year, but if you want to, give to, a, but if you want to participate in the party and auction, you've got to do your charitable giving on that particular night. So the wine auction could, using a $7 per month vending machine, sell a customized charity token year-round that represents $1 of charitable giving to the foundation. When the night of the auction arrives, donors from all over the world bid in real time with tokens received from their donations over the course of the year. And if they find themselves short, they can always quickly donate more to get that winning edge. Auctions really haven't changed much during my lifetime. Whether you're talking about eBay or that wine auction, one of the biggest problems is phantom bidders, who either wind up winning multiple items and then don't have the funds to pay, or are just bidding up the price because they can't. Running an auction using tokens obsoletes this problem. Auctions are cash on the barrel, and to increase one's bid when you've been surpassed, you merely send more of the token to the auction. If you don't win or you've been outbid and don't intend to keep bidding, you quickly and easily get all of your tokens back, plus a little bonus from whoever outbid you for your trouble. And why stop there? Each item being auctioned should itself be represented by a unique token, redeemable for the prize, which would allow people to bid and win items even if they don't want or can't use them themselves. In token form, the prize can be traded, uh, given, and even sold without any impact or additional work on the part of whomever is providing the prize. And this is another commonality in the things that I'm excited about. They present new, empowering opportunities for users without putting additional burden on the merchant or the platform. Another more layered example is Netflix. Netflix's streaming service has totally changed the way that I, along with quite a few others, consume content. And for all the advantages that it has, you'll notice that there are quite a few titles they don't have and won't likely get in the near future. This is because the streaming service, unlike their discs and a mail service, can only showcase titles which Netflix can get bulk all-you-can-eat licensing terms on for all their users at a price that Netflix is willing to pay. It doesn't matter if I'd personally pay a dollar or two fifty or five dollars to watch a new release because the studios don't trust Netflix and lacking trust, that deal can't happen. Imagine for a second that those publishers Netflix has to negotiate with created redeemable and access tokens that represent and allow, and allow the streaming of those premium films. Now, instead of only having the all-you-can-eat option, Netflix has the choice to buy for sale copies as access tokens or single-use tickets in the form of redeemables, potentially in bulk, and then rent or sell them to their users for a profit. A user who just wants to watch the film uh, once would buy the cheaper redeemable ticket and spend it to start the movie. Um, or give them access for 24 hours. If you like the movie, you can buy the access token version and add that title to your premium library. When you're done with it, you can lend, give, or sell it to someone else. And actually, Netflix doesn't even have to sell these tokens directly. The filmmakers or publishers can set up their own vending machines, market directly to their audience, and pay Netflix to associate this token and stream their video as merely a content delivery network. If you're going to do that with Netflix, why not Amazon too, and every other streaming service at the same time for that matter? 
Tokens upend the current reality where the platform does the picking and sometimes even gets exclusivity to one where the content creator, the filmmaker, the writer, or whatever type of creative worker you can imagine can use these closed gardens merely as infrastructure providers rather than having the option to partner, license, or go away. If I want to sell my audiobook on Audible, why does the platform set the price and take 50% of every sale? Because they have a monopoly. The content lives, breathes, and dies on their platform and at their discretion. And that is the big point. I'm almost done here. Tokens take the productive output of normal people, which for all of my life has been trapped on closed, proprietary platforms that eventually turn into abusive monopolies and puts power into the hands of anyone who wants to create. In an environment where only bad options exist, the least bad will suffice. And that's been the story of ownership on the internet to this, to this point. Tokens aren't for every situation and won't change the way that we'll do everything, but they do give us better options and put the individual on a level playing field, even with the biggest platform. There is a lot more of this. I have like 10 different papers that I can share with anybody who's actually interested uh, detailing different business models. We think that the opportunity here is absolutely huge. Um, uh, I'm out of time. So I'm actually not out of time. I have three minutes and 50 seconds left. Man, I burned through that. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that, uh, that we have, if there are any. What kind, of, what kind of feedback are you getting from the earliest um, merchant users on the Tokenly platform? So we've been in a closed alpha um, since July. And basically, in July, we hit the point where we could release our very most basic toolkit and discover all of the things that were wrong with it. So our largest user actually to this point is a collectible card game called Spells of Genesis that um, if anybody's interested, it's as far as I know the first blockchain based collectible card game and they use tokens to represent access tokens um, to represent uh, cards within their system. So if you buy a card from their digital vending machine and then you associate your Bitcoin address with your account on their game site, then all of the tokens that correspond with cards you get access to. And so the feedback that we've gotten uh, has been, this is great, we're making money hand over fist, uh, you know, can you implement this right now? <laughs> and so, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, but, but that said, they are really our only successful use case at this point. And collectible card games, um, you know, have been like this thing that's been talked about for a long time. Um, what I'm really excited about is rolling this out to merchants and, like I said, partnering with crowdfunding platforms because these are tools that you don't have to use. Uh, you don't need to go to eBay to have an auction anymore, basically. All you got to do is make sure that your auction is all happening on the Bitcoin blockchain. And when it's on the Bitcoin blockchain, that means you can put portals to it everywhere. There's a concept that I'll just go over real briefly that I've been excited about for almost two years now called window shop advertising. And basically, somebody's going to, you know, if it's not us, somebody's going to make a lot of money with this. The idea here is that using a normal display advertisement space, right, so this is not very valuable, CRM, cost per thousand, you know, pennies on the, it's, it's not very valuable. And uh, that's been very frustrating to me as a content creator for a long time. The reason why it's not valuable is because all it is is a billboard. So if you have this ability to put, to kind of plug in uh, a vending machine or a store system or, you know, a redemption system or whatever into any web page, why can't you do it in display advertisements? Why, don't, why, why isn't it that when I click on a display advertisement, it pops up and sells it to me right there on the site? If you look at the way that uh, like Wikipedia works in terms of advertising compared to a community site, you'll notice very quickly that people click on ads on Wikipedia because they don't care that it's going to take them off the page. But if, they, if you're like on a community site where you know, want to participate, then the advertisement might be interesting, but you're not looking to leave. And so the stickiness of those ads and the ability to, you know, to generate those clicks goes down quite a lot. So that, I mean, the rabbit hole is really deep on this one. Um, we're looking for partners, we're looking for uh, basically people who can see the vision here. Um, and I'm not sure I mentioned this, but my company is entirely open source. We're building all of these things in a way that will both spoil the market for people who, uh, for companies that try to build it in a proprietary fashion, because open source has never really had this opportunity before. Most of the time what happens is an open source project comes in after a market has already been established. And so because of that, they're fighting incumbency and they're fighting pr prior adoption. But with tokens, when I recognized this opportunity, I saw a completely green field. And so the way that we've built it is to invite everyone who wants to do anything into our ecosystem, to participate in our ecosystem, become a part of it, become a steward of it, and as such, build this thing out in a way so that it can be broadly available, whether low cost or no cost or you know, hosted solutions or not. So uh, thank you very much for your time. My name is Adam B. Levine. Feel free to 
email me at adam at letstalkbitcoin.com if you want to get in touch.